Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your Army and Air Force Exchange Service Senior Enlisted Advisor. I am super pumped today because not only do we have two special guests, but I also brought a special co-host, my counterpart from the Navy Exchange Command Master Chief, Dana Wynn. Dana, how you doing today, brother? Man, I am doing I'm doing great today. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this interview. I'll tell you, our listeners are in for a real treat today. Hey, Roy, how are you doing? Hey, Chief, it's good to be back. Thank you so much. <laughs> so let me get this going, right? Today, we are honored to have two special guests with us. He is one of our nation's heroes, a retired Navy SEAL who earned a Navy Cross and Purple Heart for his actions during Operation Red Wing against the Taliban in Afghanistan in 2005. During that mission, he was the only survivor. He is the author of the book, Lone Survivor, which tells the story of his brothers in arms who made the ultimate sacrifice. He is here with his wife, his biggest supporter, and together they inspire others to never quit. It's our honor to welcome Marcus and Melody to trail. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> All right, Chief. And a quick note here for all those watching, please drop us a note in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Share some love with Marcus and Melanie in the comments below and leave your questions for them too. We will be reading them live. You can also start a watch party and enjoy this live interview with your friends. If you're not already following our page, you should. Chief chats are every Tuesday and Thursday. Following us will help keep you informed on our future guests. Hey, so let's get this going. Marcus, Melanie, it's truly a privilege to talk with you today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, you know, to hang with the exchange family, not only the Army and Air Force exchange family, but also the Navy exchanges exchange family. So we, you know, we got close to together, I think almost 750,000 followers. I hope they're all tuning in to watch this. It's going to be a special treat. So let me, let me get this going. I was watching some videos. I have, to, I have to know this, Marcus, Melanie. Do you guys live like on a safari? Like, like where, where do you where do you live? I saw a penguin, giraffes. Like, do you own a zoo? I'm trying to understand what is going on out there. Where are you at? And how's everything been going? So we we live about an hour north of Houston on a very small ranch in Texas terms. Um, but my dad has a really big ranch about an hour north of us, and he does have really crazy exotic animals out there. And since Corona started, our work kind of went to nothing and we decided why not go up and enjoy the time at, at the ranch. And we, uh, yeah, he has giraffes. He has a, a fake penguin. It's a statue my little sister got. And we- I thought that was real. <laughs> no, we call him Pepper the security guard. He stands at the gate. And, so uh, there's a story behind that guy too. Yeah. The, I want to hear it. I want to yeah, hear it. I'm, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Before I get into that, hey, uh, great job on, on the whole, man. You know, there's certain people who have certain jobs in our family. I mean, we wear the forever uniform, right? You just get to put your name on it for a little while. When you truly see people who are good at what they do, I mean, like fired up about it, it like fires you up in, in every capacity. And I just wanted to know, man, it's a blessing to be on here with you guys. But, uh, uh, when it comes to the ranch, you, you're not going to believe it. Okay, so you're not going to believe this. I was small town. I mean, a military just E5 mafia, the whole nine yards, right? I mean, so I get out, and, and then uh, I meet Melanie, and I, I marry into this family. We might be a little crazy. It's like traveling. Back <laughs> See, we got giraffes running around out here and zebras and and. and, and and like 25 different kinds of game you could see in Africa on top of all the native stuff that we have to Texas and the land that we, that the, the family owns. So going from the military and everything that I, I ever had to go through in my life. And for those of you who don't know, all I did was put the uniform on and I was granted this life. I just kept showing up, you know, believe in the Lord with all your heart and trust your, you know, the guy to the right and left of you and just keep pushing. Right. So I, all the blessings that I had were just because I was willing to stand there and take it. Just, just take the uniform. That's all you have to do. If you can just take the uniform, it, you know, it'll send you to a better place. And now with all this, it's funny because I haul out the trash in the morning. That's kind of my job. You know, like I, 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 <laughs> you know, you know, protection and enforcement. That, that's ultimately what we do. Right. And uh, 
but being out with the family and running around, it's, it's like being back in time. I mean, it, it, it truly is. It's, it's something and it's made uh, this, this whole quarantine thing. It, it's taught me a lot. It's taught me how to have patience again. Cause when you're in the uniform, you guys won't understand this because for every 10 you're in, there's two, you have to be out to unwind. But you literally forgot how to have a, a enjoy the moment kind of moment. Because in the middle of our moments in the uniform, you're thinking about the next evolution and how you to prep for it. So you kind of lose the ability to, to enjoy what's around you. And I, I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm, this is what I just learned through all of this. And that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be when we're, when we're, when we're jocked up. But when you're not, remember when you get out to, to, to the unwind part is very, very important. Yeah, embrace the relaxed time. And we realized during this quarantine, it's the first time since we've been married, we've been married for almost 10 years. It was the first time that we had the ability to relax and to just enjoy ourselves and our family and our time and not be on a schedule and not have to be doing for something for somebody else. And so we've been staying, we've been living up at the, at the big family ranch um, since March and Marcus goes around and talks to the giraffes and chases the zebras and does all that kind of stuff. And he's been posting it on Facebook and people are like, where are you? <laughs> I thought, I thought you were like in Africa or something. I was like, you called your giraffe New York. You have names. I was like, New York. I was like, I get it. It's all, <laughs> it's all mapped out. It's, it's grid. And with the penguins. So my last platoon, our, we, uh, we, we, we would get a mascot and the SEAL teams, the platoon would have a mascot and ours was a penguin. So we had our new guy dress up in a full fledged penguin outfit. So anytime we were out in town or doing something other than military stuff, he would have to wear that or one of them would. So much so that he came out with two, we were doing our FTX in the Master Chief, the XO and the C over there and uh, like grading us and he comes out in that costume with two 60s in his in his hand just firing i mean it was the it was the best thing so when i got when i got to the ranch and saw the penguin i was like absolutely i mean I, that's an integral part of my life and just like in the military it's those little things that we uh, this is how you know if somebody's been in the military right it's not the lingo or so much that anybody else can pick up it's that little hidden stuff that shows up that no one knows about that that's the that's our bloodline Okay, that's the pass down and it only exists in our world, right? So don't ever forget that part. And I know sometimes it can get frustrating, but that's the beautiful part of our life and our existence. So he loves the penguin. My little sister saw the, the penguin statue at a place on the side while she was driving on the highway and she pulled over and she loved the penguin and we put it outside the gates and yeah, it, it's Pepper the security guard. <laughs> nice, very nice. Marcus, Marcus, you spoke of Texas and, and where you are currently. Can you talk to us a little bit about growing up in Texas and what it was like um, and what inspired you and your twin brother to join the military? And, and quickly shout out to all the twins out there because I am a twin as well, but my sister didn't follow in my footsteps, but she has read all of your books. So, You know the deal, being a twin is different. It, it, it is. So he's, he's my mirror. He, he's the left side, I'm the right. He's left-handed, he does everything. I mean, he's com com our complete opposite. I mean, my, my wife and I talk about this all the time, but we're inseparable. Our father raised us that, that way. Our, our, our saying is from the womb to the tomb. We came into the world together, we're gonna leave it together. And no matter what, your brother will always be there for you. Absolutely. Being born in Texas is a big deal. I mean, I, I tell people I'm American made, Texas edition, special forces package. So, I, I mean, the, the swagger we have comes from the guys who came before us. I mean, we had our asses whipped a, a, a lot back in the day. So, you know how it is in the family, especially in the military. If you got one of those units who always getting beat up and beat down, they're the ones you send into the bad stuff. But they got the, the respect they carry is different, right? It's just because, man, we're, we're down here in Texas, we're kind of like the shoulders of the United States. As everybody, if we go through all this, we're just kind of sitting here taking it in the middle. And, um, I grew up on a horse ranch. My mother is a, 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 a horse lady, like a, like a, and a hippie, a real one. I mean, straight to the core. So I, I, I grew up on a quarter horse and thoroughbred uh, racing and breeding farm, about 800 horses at any given time. My father was a chemical engineer and probably one of the smartest men I ever met. And he was a Navy man. All the men in my family, uh, generations back, if there's something going down, serve. A and the women. I got a cousin that was a, uh, an Apache pilot while Mo my brother and I were actually overseas with her. It, it was awesome. 
but it's not a mandatory thing. It's just kind of understood. I would hear my father say, he's like, before you exploit this country, son, you're going to serve her in some form or fashion. You know, I didn't have any idea what that meant. And when you're younger and you see everybody in uniform, you kind of like, oh, you know, it's like a, a mean life or it's a hard life. But people don't understand that we have the exact same life that America has. It's just we identify ourselves by our, our skin color is different. It turns to camouflage and then you have the Air Force colors. And that's just not an identity thing. And then we meet in the mornings for muster to make sure everyone survived the night because we got some crazy people in our family. You know, we're going to find out what we're doing for the day. And then you go out after muster and you're a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, or you can be a team guy or you can be whatever. It, it, it's, a, it's the perfect nuclear family. That's what the military is. But depending on who's teaching you that when you're a young person gives you your perception of what you're getting into. Like with West Point, it's just gray walls and dismal, but it's the most, it's the, and the, and the Naval Academy are the, are the greatest universities there are, right? The Air Force Academy is in one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I was talking to a buddy of mine earlier, a team guy, he lives there. He, get, he got stationed there. And, and they, don't, they also don't understand, like, if you go in and if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, we actually push you in that direction because there's somebody behind you who wants your job and there's somebody ahead of you who wants to leave the job. So it, it's a give and take, right? So I grew up with that mentality coming up, but they 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 pulled the military aspect away from it, right? And, and I, as and I have the same friends I've had since I was a boy, and I tell people that I have those friends because they possess a strength that I have as a weakness. That's what the military is. I mean, you can call us a family or a gang or, or or whatever you want. To, I don't care what you call us, man, but. After everything that we go through together, especially in our past, because we keep track of it, our history, it lets you know what you're stepping into. And um, as I grew up, it was never pushed on me that I had to go in. It, it, it just wasn't. Now, if you chose that life, then they'll get you ready for it. That, that's the way it is. And even in my house, there's no metals on the wall or anything like that, except for in the man cave. It, um, but, then, but there's flags and stuff, right? So it's just kind of, you want to... I try to give my kids everything that America has to offer. And then if, if they want to go into the part that, that provides that and protects it, well, that's different altogether. Be because once we saddle up for that, your mentality changes, your attitude changes. I'm not saying for the work, for the work, it's just different. I mean, there's a difference between a, a, a citizen and a civilian, the, the protected and, and the ones who protect. And once you've had a taste of that life, the beginning, you know, it was terrible because you got to, it's like breaking, it's like working out for the first time. You just got to get used to it. But once you get in there and you actually have a, and, and get an appetite of what, what, what our family is and how broad it is, then you don't ever go back. And, and that was, that was instilled into me here. Marcus, I tell you, that's a, that's a great story, but I, I how did you know you wanted to be a Navy SEAL? And then, you know, what lessons did you take from your time uh, as a Navy SEAL through to your your civilian life, if you will? You got it. So uh, I've been an identical twin. My, my brother is the alpha. All right. He was born first. He, you know, he, he's mean. He was the officer in the in the family. So take that for consideration. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so ding, uh, ding. Right. So uh, when. when uh, I was we still, hey, we still love all the officers out there. We still love you. All. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> um, he, he came up with the idea. He was like, hey, we're going to be Navy SEALs. And I didn't know what that was. I remember thinking, I was like, okay, I don't know what that is. He's like, no, it's, it's great. It, it stands for Sea, Air, and Land Specialist. He read a magazine article. Back in the day, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine what had got him so fired up about it. But there was, you know, he had, he had read some stuff about it. And this is back in the 1900s, right? This is before the internet. <laughs> So you had to have your ass in front of the TV with a book that had the, the, what time something was coming on, or you had to go to the library and actually learn, right? Hey. And, um, I mean, you still learn on the computer, but anyways, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you, these younger kids, man, you can't break their, you can't break their feelings too, too bad. You don't want to be too hard on them. But uh, he's like, man, we get to jump out of airplanes and shoot guns and blow stuff up and scuba dive. And he's like, there's a real good chance we're going to die. He's like, we're signing up. We're going to be an expendable asset. We get paid to take risks. We get paid to die if necessary. And if you grow up in an environment where you think that you're expendable, then you, you go and you become expendable till you become dependable. And people are just like, that's the guy I need right there. 
I don't, I don't pick him first. I don't pick him last, but I'd make damn sure he's on my team. Okay. Just that, that's just the way every, in every unit and every squad and every branch, we have them guys. Everyone knows who they are. Like I, you know, I don't, he's not the, you don't put him in this position because that's not what he's made of. That's the beautiful thing about the military is you can see that. True. So we started training. I mean, to, to kind of get ready for that lifetime, you know, and, and there was military guys around us. It was the Vietnam veterans who trained us, so they didn't talk about it. You know, you remember those guys, man, they got the the shovel and the blanket when they got back. So yeah. they don't they never say anything. And if they did, it was always bad. You know, they're just and they're, they're they're the toughest among us because of that. They had to deal with that crap and then come back and deal with it here. So when you have those as your those guys as your instructors, it's it's terrifying. You remember that? I mean, I, I'm looking at you guys. I know you know what I'm talking about. You had to say, <laughs> I mean, I know you know what I'm talking Wait about. Wait a minute now. I'm young here now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, those guys last forever. They, I mean, they're still around, some of them, you know, and when you run into them, it's just kind of an age is rank, no matter what. In the military, when you're still standing around a guy and he's, you know, you hear the stories that they went through, you're like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I, Roger that. I understand. And, uh, so we got uh, one of the one of the army guys got a hold of us and started training us to to go into the navy. And let me tell you something: when I joined the navy, I thought that was the biggest mistake I ever made. <clears throat> navy means never again volunteer yourself. Because when I got in there, I mean it was completely different than anything I had ever experienced. I tell people now, and this is hand hand to God. I was like, hey, they were like, I want to be a navy seal. I'm like, no, no, no. You join the Air Force or you put your butt in the Army? Because, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, especially the Air Force. Anything <laughs> hands down, go straight to the Air Force. They have special forces, which are great. The PJs and the Comptrollers, TACPs, they're just, they're, they're soft. The Navy. I, I'm getting to that point. Yeah. I do love it. <laughs> hey, go Air Force. Go Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well, I'm an 18 Delta medic. I'm a SEAL medic, so I was trained at Bragg and, and the Air Force. I, I'm a bastard. So I actually, most of the time in my beginning phases was with the Army and the Air Force. But I didn't know that when I was signing up. I, I had no idea that, that that was the longest pipeline. But it was turns out now that I'm out, it was the greatest one because I have brothers that are in the army and the, and the Marine Corps and the Air Force across the board. It's just across the board because we're, we're we integrated. Our war was different. We, we, we fought an enemy with no face. So when they put us in the box, in the sandbox over there, man, we, we you know, we, we just stuck together. I served with a guy on a deployment one time in Afghanistan. I'll never forget this. I mean, we had been out there for months. And for whatever reason, we had to identify who we were. And he was like, I, he, he wasn't a Navy SEAL. And I, I mean, we had been in combat together. I was like, you're not a SEAL? He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, what, what the hell are you? He's like, an Air Force. I'm like, oh my God. You know, it, it, because it doesn't matter, right? It's just our, our skin may be a different color, but it doesn't matter when we're in it. Right. And uh, I, I would have never learned that unless I had to go through that. And when I, when I went in, I had to go before my brother. I, 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 uh, I finished college before he did. And um, like I said, when y'all who, who – those of you who are coming into the military in the beginning now, it's kind of early phases. It's supposed to be chaos. I mean, they teach you how to sit down Indian style. It's like going back through kindergarten. You got to learn how to brush teeth and, and you got to wake up early, make, bed. Make, make your bed. I still make my bed every day, by the way, every morning I still make my bed. <laughs> that's a thing. So the more chaotic it is to you in the beginning, that's, that's good. That means you're going to be more squared away on the back end, right? And as you go through your life in the military, the best piece of advice I can give you is if, if especially if you want to go somewhere, or you want to do something, if you're so squared away, like you're really trying to trying to impress your officers and your, your senior enlisted, they won't let you go. But if you're too much of a turd in a, in a shit bag, then, then they won't want to send you where you want to go. All right. And those two terms are terms in the military. That's why I use it. And, and as, so remember that. You'll always have your overachievers and all of you are different. We're all different, right? But as you as you go through it, the more part of the team you become, the more part of the team you become. And it, it, it teaches you value that you can't even appreciate until you get out into this world. When you come, come back out through the cycle. And um, no matter what I went through in the military, and it was, every day was tough. 
I mean, they asked me like, how do you get to SEAL training? How do you get through your naval, uh, through the, through the military? Cause it's, it's, it's slow days and fast weeks. Right. And then the years fly by, they, they just fly by, especially uh, our, our generation and what we had to go through. So when you're in it, In the military, they teach teach us if we're not doing something, then something's not getting done. And if it, other than that, you need, your ass needs to be sleeping, right? So when you get out, you kind of you you you've lost that. And I had to learn how to slow back down. I mean, like I literally had to learn how to do that. Uh, a busy day for most people is they go into town and get groceries, the post office, and they come back home, maybe clean some dishes. You know, we do that before five a.m. Uh, and uh, it, it just, man, you lose that. And then if there's no one around you who understands that, then that's how you go crazy. Yeah. Okay. So remember everything cycles. That's why they call it the cycle of life. And as you progress through your military career, it will take you anywhere you want to go. Anything that exists in the United States, you can achieve in the military. You just have to ask somebody to go do it. And, and most of our leadership want to give that to you. That's why they stick around. And I, I, the best mistake I ever made and loved and, and regretted in the beginning, but I'm so thankful that I stuck to was when I signed the line. And I, I can't say, I mean, I don't even have the vocabulary to express to you the life I have out here. Well, just once I got out. And most of the, the movies and the book tours and the career, oh, that was all military driven. Like I, that, I was under orders to do that. Okay. Now, you know, I'm a civilian afterwards, but if the military will always be what you make of it and what you put into her. Like if, if the more you give back to everyone around you, they'll be like, Hey man, get that kid, whatever he wants. And I always, I was taught the best lesson, the most valuable lesson I, I got when I first came in by my chief, my C dad. He's like, work harder than everybody else. I want you on the edge where the demons live. I'll pull you back when I think you've had enough volunteer for the worst jobs that come up in front of you. And that way, when the best ones come up, they'll give them to you. And I, I did that. And it was more painful and, and than any other life path you can take, but it was the most rewarding. And when, when I say it like that, misery loves company and chaos and pain is the world that we survive in. So if you're, if you're in the uniform, if you got a brown shirt on and, and one of your days starts to get hard, because it doesn't suck. It's not a bad day. It's a hard day for us. If it starts to get hard, then you're in the right place. That, that means the civilians don't have to take it. So you're doing your job. Yeah. That, that's just the way it is. Okay, that's what you signed up for, whether or not somebody told you that or not. And, and I mean, that's an honor, commitment, and a code, because we're the ones that die for this place. That American flag sitting behind you, that red, white, and blue, it's, it's red blood, white tears, right? And, and those things bleed together. And the only ones that carry that are a handful of us. And I don't care what you do, we we're, we're all come from the same bloodline when you strap that uniform on. Exactly right. That, well, hey, Marcus, great words, a lot, of, a lot of little nuggets of great information in there. I'm going to have to go back and peel it all out. I was taking some notes on some of this stuff here, so I'm going to have to go back and write them all out. You gave a lot of great information there, so thank you for sharing that. I'm going to switch gears, Marcus. I'm going to have to go you know, to your rock, to the one who supports you. I want to know about Melanie. Melanie, how did you meet Marcus? Tell us a story, and did you know about his story before you, you, you both met? Yeah, I didn't know anything about him um we i have a friend that had introduced marcus to my dad and my dad kept talking about this retired navy seal and i wasn't really listening to him but in my head i, I thought i was old I thought, <laughs> 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 because he kept saying retired and um i don't really have anyone in my family that was in the military. So I didn't understand that you could be retired and be young. And um, so he kept saying, you know, this retired name is blah, blah, blah. He's having this, uh, he, basically it was when Marcus was starting Lone Survivor Foundation and my dad had gotten involved with it. So I, I was thinking, you know, this old man, you know, came back and is doing this, you know, great stuff with this foundation. and. Anyway, I had reached out to Marcus to tell him thank you for his service. It was Memorial Day. And I said, you probably have no idea who I am. My dad just speaks the world of you. And he sent me back. I know exactly who you are. Uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. And I'm like, wait, what? That's kind of, 
It was kind of creepy. Yeah, like I didn't understand. Stalking you. I just Googled his name and he popped up and I called my dad and I was like, Dad, he looks like he's my age. And he goes, He is. I was like, Why didn't you tell me? And I had just gotten out of a long relationship and I was ready to date. And my dad was like, Don't even think about it. That he he didn't want me to ruin his new friendship with um, Marcus, so he was like, "No, you're not. Don't think that way or whatever." And I was like, "Okay." And so Marcus and I just kept messaging each other that day and all day long, um, which turned into two weeks of nonstop talking and messaging each other. And then I was traveling. So when I got home, we met that night and um, he didn't want me to, he wanted me to go home with him. And I was like, I'm not going home with you tonight. You can come to my house tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. And he texted me when, uh, when I got in my car and he said, this will be the last time you ever leave without me. Bro, I showed up with my sea bag on my shoulder the next day. I moved in. I was like, what's up? My My sea bag. (laughs) <laughs> and no shit moved in with me the day after we met oh, yeah. and we were married within a few we would have been married probably that week if his brother was home but his brother was in iraq he was on deployment and so we had to wait for his brother to get home and we got married like within weeks of his brother getting home and giving the approval for him to marry me and um we met, yeah. on, we met on a blind date yeah i had just gotten back from africa mm-hmm. uh, and uh and we linked up and I, I laid eyes yeah. on her because my brother and I had an arrangement. We were in the military, no wife, no kids from zero to 40. And, and that lifestyle is, I'm not saying, you know, guys and girls get it done all the time. We, we just couldn't. Well, but and you then, beat that. Yeah, I beat it. No, I, I, when I, when I met her, I was like, boom. He right was there. 35 when we met and we, um, yeah, it's a, this November will be 10 years that we've been married. So congratulations. It worked. <laughs> and we have, Dude, hey, bro, yeah. my brother called from Iraq. Like, he found out that I was yeah. thinking about getting married because he has to, the, the twin thing is huge. And he calls me up, fixed to going on a mission. He's like, are you, are you getting married? I mean, he, guys tell me the stories. Like, he was jocked up with his kit and his face painted up. I'm coming home. I'll be there. Don't do anything. <laughs> and I, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was the he most was fun. It was very, crazy. very upset. It was a, they met at the White House. My brother mm-hmm. met her. They were, at, we were at the White House when they met. And it, I mean, it's the craziest story. It is. The whole, the whole thing was very crazy to me, but. Um, Hold on, I want to hear the, I want to hear the story. What happened when you met him? <laughs> not only that, Gulag was there. Yeah. So the, the guy that, oh, yeah. um, one of the guys that rescued or that, held Marcus in the village um, during Red Wing Gulab, he had, we had just gotten a a visa for him to come and see us. Mind you, I just met Marcus. Like, we were only dating for a couple of months. She didn't know anything about the military. Yeah, I (laughs) I don't know anything. And I had, at the time, uh, my son was 12, so it was just me and my son. And then Marcus moves in and then he's like, oh yeah, then this Afghani's going to come stay with us for a few weeks. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and so Google comes and lives in our house for over a month, brings a security, we have a special forces security guy attached to him and a translator because he doesn't speak any English. I mean, I pulled her right into our world. It was like, whoop! Yeah. I mean, like into, 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 the, into it, right yeah. into it. Right into it. So- <laughs> so then <laughs> while Gulab is at our house, I find out that I was pregnant. Thank you. That happened real quick. And so here <laughs> I am. I'm newly pregnant. I'm already a single mom of a 12 year old. And I had an Afghani that spoke no English dressed in full Afghani garb, like full on Fresh off the mountain. Fresh off the mountain. Afghani. And I, I left. I had to leave. Yeah. I had to go do he stuff. Had to, the- well, he had to go see Morgan because Morgan was coming back and he had to greet him. So I'm by myself with <laughs> Gulab, the security, the translator, and my son. And I'm like, this is, a, this is crazy. And Marcus said, meet us in D.C. So here I am traveling with said crew and going to dc and this is in the height of the war and here i am traveling with like what looks like the taliban 
and um he wanted to see that the white house marcus had a friend that was working in the white house a team guy that was attached to the white house at the time so we were able to take a tour so i'm walking through the white house with gulab security translator my 12 year old and we meet marcus and morgan came up and that's when i met morgan and he was not nice to me all at right, so, all he was so, so the way it works with the twin thing is, is, is when i said i was going to get married then she needs needed to see what i could look like when i was mean and angry so that yeah we kind of watch each other if you can make it through the brother then you can make it in the it's a military brother thing, you know, I mean. He was so mean and I just <laughs> cried myself to sleep and I was like, we're never gonna get married. I'm gonna be a single she mom again. It. Yeah, yeah, she earned her stripes, man. I, I'll never forget it. Especially but, going through with Gulab. And that was about the time we, we killed Bin Laden. So, I mean, it was just. It went, was right after. Yeah. It was, it was like just a couple months. Bin Laden was killed in May and this would have been in September. So it was just months after, and here I'm walking through DC with what looks, I mean, he looks like the Taliban. So he, you know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, beard then you have, then you have and, the special forces guys who are tatted up, beards down here and sunglasses, yeah. and we're just kind of, everyone's moving through the- And here's me, you know, white girl with a 12 year old son, just walking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey, what's up? People were looking at us like, what is going on? It was. I have never, it was awesome I've never experienced anything like that before, but um, it ended up being great. Everything ended well. It was just in the moment, it was weird. Um, it's but, like combat, man. It's chaos with, with enjoyment in the middle. And then there's the times where you kind of, it's the ebbs and flows of our life, right? Like I pulled her, she had never, as a wife had been on through a deployment, mm -hmm. but it didn't matter because I was technically still in. So I just drug her into our life. I mean, y'all know what it is. If, if one of us is going through it, we're all going through it. It, yeah. it. It's a uniform thing. It just feeds uh, cohesively through through it, itself. And um, I experienced deployments through Morgan. I mean, I didn't experience it through him, but like when Marcus proposed to me, he actually didn't talk at all. Morgan did all the talking and he said, you're marrying. <laughs> <up>? um, <laughs> <laughs> he said um we aren't like him and marcus aren't two people they are one and that i needed to be okay with marrying two men basically because they're <laughs> twins and that all major decisions would be made through both of them you know all major holidays would be spent together and he was basically saying like are you okay with this and um so yeah i when morgan would go on deployment it it was very personal to me because it's, you know. He married my. So he ended up marrying my best friend. They met at our wedding. Yeah. So. How about that one? Yeah. That's, it, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they have two kids and live across the street. Yeah, they live right down the road. So it worked out. Wow. Well. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, everything worked out great with Morgan. Just the first meeting was um, rough. <laughs> yeah. He's mean. My brother's mean. Everyone knows that in the military. I mean, if you know anything about it, you know he's, he's just mean, man. When he needs to be. He's very <laughs> sweet. He's an amazing guy, but when he needs to be. He can That's be. funny. See how she, she said that? When he needs to be, he can be sweet. No. <laughs> Did you hear what she said? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Melanie, hey, great story. Uh, I want to shift gears now to your uh, your husband there, the stalker, and uh, just ask you a question about uh, what motivated you to write your book, Lone Survivor, and um, uh, how was it expressing your story on paper? Okay, so this is a military deal, so I, I, that wasn't my idea. I was in the hospital, and then the uh, WARCOM came to me, Admiral, because so many people died in our community, that's one thing, but we had a fallen angel. And when an angel falls, everyone knows about it. So the stories that were coming out and I, I still in the hospital and doing my physical therapy and um, everything was assigned to me. Like I got pulled off the line for, for, for a bit and my lawyer, my literary agent, my, my, my Hollywood attorney, the director, everybody was facilitated through the military. I, I've been protected on high ground the entire time. When I got stationed, the, the book is a debrief. Like I did my JPA, 
my Air Force debrief in the hospital in Germany. And then after we got done with that, I was doing physical therapy and they were like, hey, look, you know, there's, they're, they're talking about, there's, there's the story is just on fire. And they're like, we're going to have to declassify part of this. And we're going to, because most of it was focal point. Like you, I, I couldn't even get in to see it. And I, for those of you in the military don't know what that is. It's not time for you to know what that is. You know, there's stuff past that. But anyways, I was like, okay, just tell me what I need to do. And then they would pull me in and the Admiral signed me at, at team five right beside him. And all the congressmen were calling. I remember they would call the team sometimes and want to see me. And my master chief said, well, tell the congressman if it's more important for me to pull him off the line training for combat so they can hang out, then uh, I'll see to it. He's standing tall. But other than that, don't mess with, don't mess with him or me, you know, at the team. Right. And uh, I thought that was a cool, you know, when your boys back you up, like you're like, yeah, it was. <laughs> but, uh, I went. I was in Iraq in 06 and 07. He went back, uh, and I got war. I got hurt. I got hurt again. And when I when I got back, the the book came out right before I got back from Iraq. And then they were like, "Hey, look, you're you're going on the road. You're, we're gonna uh, the literary agent in New York. They would come down to California, and, and we would all do these meetings. And I kind of got to be sitting there listening. I mean, there's a committee that watches out for me, of admirals, captains across the board." Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. I, I get debriefed even at the Pentagon. I'd have to go into the Pentagon. It was amazing. It was the best life. I couldn't, I mean, and, and we've done this in, in military throughout time. Like, you know, you pull guys offline, they go around the country and like, hey, your job's to talk about your boys and spread the word. So the book was a debrief talking about the battle. And, and they, they decided to write the book the way we did. And then the movie was, was made the way it was because that's when everyone was alive. I mean, you can't take what happened out there and, and shove it into a movie too much would get dropped. Right. Right. Well, and if you, if like, I had someone ask me this yesterday, oddly enough, but um, like the movie, they have Marcus in the village for one night, but he was really in the village for six nights. And so when people ask like, why did, why didn't they focus on that? Because the movie wasn't supposed to be about Marcus. It was about the guys <laughs> it was about honoring them. Yeah. That was the whole purpose. That's awesome. And that's what we did. Who cares if, you know, that part wasn't totally focused on, that wasn't the purpose. I, I'm real upfront about the fact that I was never the best Navy SEAL. Like I wasn't the fastest one. I was, I'm probably the slowest one. Right. And, and uh, I, I would just stand in there with you. You'll never hear me talking about, about any branch of the military. I've never done that. And this is because, I mean, the Admiral's got a hold of it. I was an E5, bro. <laughs> I was an E5 sitting in there with all the stars. I'd never seen stars in my life. I'm just kind of just, <laughs> uh, you know, what do I got to say? And um, I learned. I listened. You know, I mean, that was an advantage. And I, I, my responsibilities had been taken away from me. And I was just always told what to do. And then I would perform like a SEAL. So when they pulled me away from the community, I thought that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And they put me out with the American people and they're like, there's your new platoon. I expect you to thrive and survive. You're a SEAL. You spread the word, you adapt, you overcome, you sit in there, you learn everything you can about them and you see what this country's made of. I mean, I, was, I, I had the best coaches. I mean, they were my family. When the stars and the, and, and the bars are staring at you, that's one thing. But when, they're, when they take you under, it's like, hey, this is a family thing. So 19 promises is what I walk around with. At any given time, I could walk into anybody who had something to do, not only with pulling me out of there or with somebody who died out there. That's why you don't see me a, like a train wreck. My head's never down. You know, I, I just never, y'all had to come get me. Mm -hmm. I was in hell. I mean, I was in hell and y'all came and got, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget when a different branch of service showed up to get me out of there. I was like, oh yeah. This is a brotherhood, a family with female male that you can't even talk about. I mean, you couldn't even understand it when you're in a in hell and someone shows up to get you. I'll never forget that. I think about it every morning when I wake up. I'm like, I'm not in hell. I'm just, I'm not in hell anymore, you know? And from the life that I, the, the deepest pit I ever been in to sitting here with you right now, come on, you can't, can't tell me that this isn't an amazing life that we, we've created for ourselves. And we're the ones that hold on to it. You, you know, you know what I mean? It's just guys and girls like us who sign up, man, we want the, the roller coaster ride. You, you just do. Yeah. And um, from the book to the movie, and when I, when I met her, I mean, it just kind of, everything just fell into, into, into place. And I always, and no matter how much I learn, 
Like it's a seals, you try to earn your trident every day. I try to be a specialist every day, man. And I get to the point to where I wake up in the morning, like I don't know nothing. I, I try not to know anything. So when I walk in, I see how much I, how fast I can learn or what I do know about what's in front of me. And that just eliminates any of the problems that I would kind of run into ultimately with my, because as a seal, man, I was trained my bravado and my pride and everything, my honor and my integrity, man, I wore that in front of me. The guy, you know, I didn't care what, I, I don't care what guys think. What are you going to say? It's a guy just talking smack. You know what I mean? If my, if my wife or my mom's upset, then I'll deal with it. But other than that, I don't give a damn. You know what I mean? I just don't care. That's not my job. And then when you get out and you get kids and you, you, you kind of, your family and your community, common unity, right? We live together. But in, in our world, my table that I sat at, you you expected me to be like that. You, you trained me to be like that. And everybody asked me why I went back to combat. I was like, why in the hell wouldn't I? I'm, I'm, that's what I do, man. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? My, my family expects me to do that. So that's the best part about this world is that, man, we not only expect this out of you, you know, you expect to keep, you know, pull your weight. That's it. That's all we ask, man. Just pull your damn weight. Don't pull somebody else's because you, that's not what we do here, man. You just pull yours. And, uh, yeah, I could, man, I'm so thankful for, even to this day, when I see y'all in a uniform, man, you, you got to understand, that drags me right back. Even my vocabulary changes. You know, I use profanity. <laughs> I was like, man, hey. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's, it's awesome. It, so, no matter what point you're at in our world, as you're going through it, don't worry about it. Because these transitions better than the last. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Marcus, you touched a little bit on the 2014 movie, Lone Survivor. Many of us have seen this movie featuring, uh, starring Mark Wahlberg, uh, who you're close with now. Uh, what was it like having that specific story told so publicly? So when it's, it, I hear a lot of older uh, people talk about the Vietnam guys, like they never talked about his story or their stories in combat. And I'm like, yeah, they did. They just didn't talk to you about it. <laughs> so I had a, out of everybody who was, I, I, like, that was my duty. My, my, I got selected. This I got to tell this story. And the more I got up on stage and the more I had to talk to everybody around me about it, the, the, the more, and they would always tell me, hey, good job. You know, hey, we're, we're proud of you. So my, I mean, that just rebuilt me physically. So when the movie came around, you hear these nightmare stories about Hollywood and the people up there. I had the best time. I mean, Mark Wahlberg is the greatest guy. I mean, Ben Fox, kids, all, all, all of them. Alexander, I talk to him on a regular basis, Pete especially, because I had to live with him. I mean, I got stationed up. When I showed up to the director's house, Peter Berg, I remember, remember uh, I got a car, I was in Brentwood. I was like, how, why would I know Brentwood? He goes, OJ lived right there. I was like, yes, <laughs> this story's awesome. You know, I just kind of kept going and going. And, and every day was a moment where, I mean, I was still a, a SEAL, but I went on, on, the, on the combat line but it was still like combat. It doesn't matter where we put you, it's combat. Just do the best you can. And everyone was just so amazing because of the, not just because of me, it was because of everybody, yeah. man. Just the whole, everybody who died on the mountain touched somebody in a certain way. People who saved me, it was just so many facets to it that I was just honored to be there, right? And I would help out any way I could. I never, I never thought about myself, so I never had any problems. I'm always trying to worry about somebody else. So I, you know, if you're not worried about yourself, then you won't have any issues. Well, the director allowed an open set to any SEAL. So they were everywhere. They were I everywhere. Mean, SEALs, Warcom shut everything else down mm -hmm. except for that movie. And so it was, I think that it was different than other um, military movies because of that. They were it was infiltrated with active duty and retired SEALs and everyone working on set, whether it was an A-list actor or someone you've never heard of or the girl in the snack cart, everyone felt the power of what the movie was supposed to represent and what the purpose was. And they really put their heart into it. And I think it's because Marcus was there other team guys were there, even team guys we had never oh, man, met before. I mean, from different generations. People showing up on the set. Like, people I'm not even getting paid to be here. Yeah. I, I'm just. They didn't pay us to be here. Yeah, we didn't, even, we didn't even get paid. I was like, man, I, I was like, it man, was, it was like, really, man we're, we're here for, uh, for them. It was really neat to see how much the 
people, I mean, everyone from like, you don't realize how many people work on a movie until you're on a set, but there's like carpenters and all kinds of people building the thing. Every single person, even the um, people that played the Taliban, like those actors were like this, you know, story has really affected me. And it, everyone felt like they wanted to honor all the fallen. And it was, that was the really powerful thing. And Marcus won't ever say it, but it was really hard on him through that whole, he will act like he's all tough. <laughs> it was really hard on him during that whole thing because it is reliving that. And everyone there could see that. So it did make it even more powerful. So Hollywood set up like the military on a movie set. You have the motor pool, you have you know, comms, electronics. But the only difference is, is they don't have one boss. Like everybody has kind of, so when they move, they don't move as fast as we do. That's why when you saw the Range 15 boys got a movie filmed in a month or something like that, as opposed to however long it takes. But that's their, that's, that's just their world. It, that, you know, there are stars, it's Hollywood. And, but out there and everybody we ran into, I mean, they sent us to Japan and in, everywhere in between to do, to do the movie stuff. All the, the reporters on, on the news. I mean, everybody I had to come into contact with. Because I was always trained, you try to make a best friend wherever you go. Money is money will burn up, you'll spend it. But if you make a friend, a teammate, then they'll always be there. Mm -hmm. So I keep in touch with everybody that we've run into mm -hmm. on, on purpose. Like, it's that, that's kind of like the job. I'm like, hey, I'm checking in, just seeing what you're doing, right? And it's been how many years? I mean... Yeah. We were doing all that, all that started, the movie, we filmed it in 2012. 2013 was promoting the movie. Mm -hmm. So we pulled her in there, extortion went down, all the people started dying, I knocked her up. We had a book, a movie, <laughs> we had a half, I mean, and all that. She made it, guys. I mean, we're talking about a, a unicorn here. <laughs> She's a keeper. She's a keeper, man. <laughs> uh, and in 2014, the movie came out. and. In that time, yeah, a lot of his friends were dying um, in the war. Our, our team, you know, our family, man. You know how we do it. Um, just, uh, he was really close with Chris Kyle. He had died right before the movie came out. I mean, like a month. And um, it was it, it was a hard, really hard year. But I feel like the movie um, did so well because people, when people watched it, it was like they felt that emotion. They felt some sort of connection um that's all i cared about i was like the family signs off on it and if military people will watch it on tnt yeah. on on, uh, on veterans day or memorial day then we did our job mm -hmm. like if guys will literally look at it and be like okay that the, yeah. uh, not not it was great or, or just a pat you know you just get a pass for military people there's certain movies when you watch it you're like okay you know because the actors got consumed i mean we had we blanketed them with seals and EOD. And I mean, just special forces guys, they were just, I mean, beating the mess out of them. Mm -hmm. Those actors on that set earned it. Each one of them guys, you throw them a rifle from Wahlberg to Ben Foster, especially Ben Foster. You give that guy an M4, he will go to work. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, even at distance, it, it, it's impressive to watch. But we didn't cut them any fire. slack. Oh, live fire is shooting over them around. Most people don't know. That. They had live fire training. I mean, dude, we just beat the mess out of them, man. They were terrified in the beginning. Now they don't even. It's like whatever. The funniest story <laughs> is that um, before filming started, they um, Peterberg had them go through these live fire training drills and um, different. I don't know what you call it, like a tactics um, training or whatever, just to learn how to maneuver, to move and run, and all that kind of stuff. And um, on the first day, it was hot as heck this is in new mexico and it was so freaking hot and um this like snack person comes out oh, literally with a that. silver platter like a real <laughs> silver platter with smoothies and like snack fruits and stuff to give to the actors seaweed wrap protein paste <laughs> i mean like literally this dude walks with there's a line of seals we're on the range with live fire uh -huh. And this dude walks between the tray was so shiny that it ref the sun was refreshed. That's how we noticed it with protein paste for the actors. And they're like, okay, time out. And they were, and they handed it that. We, we, we didn't know what to do. Marcus like, is like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you not get it smoothies during live fire training get that I out of here that. he was so mad i mean we took him off the deep end after that they were they were, they were, they were used to getting coddled and i mean it was 
it yeah. was rough out there. I mean, we were yeah. in the mountains, dude. I mean, the stuntmen were getting hurt every day, and the actors getting torn up, dude. It was, it was. So they, they they paid for those smoothies. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, he didn't let them have them. We took the, all the military <laughs> people took them. We're like, give me, give me that. What are you talking about, man? Like, it's a, it was just like the instructors. If the instructors were standing there, you'd be like, hey, the students don't get anything. Yeah. What are you even talking about, man? It was fun. Awesome. Hey, to quick, uh, let me get, let me give a quick plug though. You mentioned, uh, Melon, you mentioned Taya Kyle and I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So to everyone out there watching, I reached out to Taya Kyle. We did an interview with her and it went great. And I asked her, Hey, could you get us, you know, Marcus, Melanie Luttrell. And sure enough, she, you know, she linked us up on, on email and gave me your phone number. So thank you much enough to Taya Kyle. If you're watching, we love you. Thank you very much for linking us up with Marcus and Melanie. Yeah. Taya is one of our closest friends. We love her. She's uh, yeah, she's strong. Strong woman, man. It's a blessing to have her around. So th thank you, Taya, for hooking this up. She was she was fired up about it. She'll call up every now and again. She'll ask me. When she calls up, she's like, hey, you're doing this. I'm like, okay, roger that. Yeah. Text me. She's like, she, she didn't something. ask. She was just like, hey, you guys are doing it. I'm like, okay, roger that. <laughs> I love you, Taya. Thanks. Right on. Right on. Hey, Marcus and Melanie, uh, we know you love to help people. And right now, there's a lot of people suffering out there during this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, what words of encouragement or hope can you offer them? Can you go first? No. Okay, so my favorite meme that came out from one of the boys in my one of my commands was a picture of Mad Max, right? He was dressed up, he was road warriors out his guns. And then the next one was the dude from the Big Lebowski. He had his robe, he was in the supermarket. Yep. He's like, what I thought I would be wearing during the apocalypse and actually what I'm wearing during it. And it, it's kind of one of those, those, those shifts, right? So know that as, as we transition as a country, and we've done this, if you study our past, which we have to do in the military, you know that we go through these transitions. Yeah. It is as it's written, you know, in God we trust. If you have that uniform on or if you've walked in this life, you're prepared for any and everything that's coming down. To ultimately be a citizen of this country, you have to suffer a little bit. People are figuring that out. Every 250 years, a country will go through its era of decadence. We're doing that. You know that when the chefs are famous. That's how I read about, you know, in Rome. That's when you, when you start seeing stuff like that, you know that the times are great, right? And then there'll always be that kind of push down. And as we go through that, understand that we've gone through it. You've shotgunned yourself past what most people are having to experience right now. I've told my family the whole time we were going through, it's like, man, you're, we're on a deployment. This, this is the deployment. This is exactly what this is like. I mean, you hear people getting killed somewhere over there, and then it's chaos at our house for a little bit, and, and that's just how it is. To us, it's life. To everybody else, it's falling apart. When you go through stuff like this, and I don't care where you're at, man, if you get quarantined down, that's a training cycle. Anybody and everybody around you, they're training you. Because you don't go through something like this and come out weaker. That's just not the way this works. When you go through battle, you don't come out battle weekend. You come out battle tested and battle hardened. The minute you pick yourself up and stand back forward, you are automatically ahead of somebody else who didn't go through it. And life is rites of passage. And the, through the younger generation who are coming up, man, y'all are forged in fire. It started with us, our generation, with this crazy 20 year war with an enemy with no face. You know what I mean? It's like everything shifted. We just even, we, we didn't even know. And now they're, they're dealing with this. They're dealing with the pandemic and civil unrest. And then, and that's everywhere. So, in, and always remember this, man, you don't run to your death. Never be anxious in anything. Always let it unfold and then step into it. Good, bad, or indifferent, you step into it. That's what we do. And, and, and it'll work itself out. But don't let the fear sit in. And, and absolutely, no matter what, I don't care how hard you get hit and how many times your ass gets knocked down, you get back up. Because that's what we do. Get that flag on your heart or over your arm, and that is just the way it is, period. Yeah. I heard a saying um, that the devil doesn't need to tempt you himself if he can just keep you busy. And I feel like our lives have just been, especially ours, has been so busy that this opportunity during quarantine was a time for us just to step back, relax, realize, assess what's going on, and just to, like realize we need to focus on our family. That's all that matters. Do we have food to eat? Do we have shelter? Do we have faith in each other? And, you know, make sure we're all good and then nothing else matters. And that's really what it's done for us. I mean, we, I think the quarantine whole time period, this 
whole chaos around the world, it's been awesome for us because we've just focused on family. Yeah, and civilians, they're just getting locked down to their barracks and having to wear a mask, getting told what to do. Yeah. I mean, that's our life every day. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I mean, so many people are like worrying because things aren't normal, but what is normal? I mean, everyone has learned how to adapt. We're doing Zoom, for goodness sakes, you know, to do this. Everyone has learned how to keep moving yeah. keep doing their thing and as humans we're going to naturally learn how to adapt to any situation so i think that's the most important thing is just keep on doing that and there's this lesson for everybody in the military like when you see the civilians out and watch them like walk around the street like when you're walking around look at look at how people are reacting to certain situations that we get put in every day it lets you know how far advanced trained and and well equipped you are to handle the situations around us it's just everybody else is having to catch they didn't volunteer for it it's just getting shoved on them right, right? with us we kind of like signed up and I was like all right you know kick me in the face you know teach me what i need to know so it, it, with regards to that with all of us man you guys always remember that and we're, we're a team if, if this whole thing starts to fall apart you think everybody in uniform is going to consolidate in one area and we'll take it back I have I mean, come thought on. about there's <laughs> I mean, a couple times when i watch the news and i see like these crazies taking over parts of Seattle or parts of Portland or whatever. And I'm like, you just need to go whip their ass. Yeah, a bunch of white kids who had their ass whipped or spanked. Just, and then I was like, dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> just go zip tie them and oh, whip man. their ass. That's all they need is they need a mama that spanks. Yeah. And, <laughs> or send them uh, in the military and <laughs> let them get tuned up by a sergeant major, you know, or sergeant airborne just looks at you like sideways when you, when you don't get your way. I'm like, man, you guys there's being upset when you're supposed to be upset and then there's just there's deviance in every squad you guys know that i mean we've been in this long enough i don't care how cool the fraternity is there'll be a couple of deviants in there they like to start i was one of them that's how i know all right i recognize what's going on and it just takes those alphas like with us man through all this lot most of our alphas joined the military we had you know we had fight a damn war two of them so that that's what's happening mm -hmm. and it'll work itself out i don't i'm not sweating yeah I'm not scared, but if we need to, we'll go. <laughs> I'm a mama that whoops. So <laughs> I fully believe in the power of a wooden spoon. And some of those people out there need that. I was like, man, you, all you need to do is take all, take all the, the, the badge off those officers, take their guns away from them, give them a leather strap, and just be like, hey, man, go tune them up. <laughs> like, ain't hey, you know, you me. You're just getting out of line, or, you know, just go tune their ass up. Because a lot of people are, are, are so riled up that they're past talking. You guys, you know how it is, man. You get you get so worked up, man. It doesn't matter what you say. It just makes people more pissed off. And then there's only one level after that, and that's our world. Yeah. That's, that's usually when they call us in, right? Like, if you don't want to talk about this anymore, if the politicians can't figure it out, there's a line past that. And that's when you step to us. So I, I don't want them to ever forget that. You know what I mean? I just, you don't want to deal with, with us because we spent our life protecting you and you really have any idea how dangerous we are because of what we've had to go through for the last 20 years. It's created something in a unique environment with a couple of generations that has never been created before on the planet, ever. And you couldn't be as extreme as I was on the level I was if all of y'all weren't the same. You have to be as extreme as I am in every department. That's why we can exist. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. That's how the military works. That's how I know we're the same. And, I, you know, the younger generation, man, they've just got way too much information on life experience. They just get upset. And, and they should. A lot of us should be. I mean, there's plenty to be upset about. You know, just don't, don't tear your own stuff down. And in our, our world, we talk about it. So going down, so going down this this path, right, that we're talking about right now, Marcus. We know you've gone through so much. Most of us can imagine your sacrifices during Operation Red Wing. You know, you're known for resiliency in the face of adversity. Melanie, you were thrust into this lifestyle, right? So you had to overcome some challenges. Why do you believe resiliency is so important? Is do you believe resiliency is something you're born with, or can it be taught? And how can people become more resilient? I definitely think it can be taught. Um, I was never like an aggressive person. I'm still not, um, that's not me, but I do, especially being married to Marcus, like I've learned that you can, it's all in your mind and you can, you know, have that mindset that you're either gonna get through something or you can lay back and, you know, cry and whine and do nothing about it. Um, and that's one of the biggest things Marcus has taught me is just to keep focused 
focused on what's good and what's right and fight for that. And I, I definitely think that that's something that can be taught I think there's definitely people that are born with it um, or they were just raised at a young age to do that. But, but it can be something that anyone can train their mind to, to just be a fighter for goodness. You know, like I'm not, a, I'm not a fighter at all, but I, I will fight for something that's good. It's just like with anything, when we come into this world, come in on our back, butt naked, we don't know nothing. It's like getting a brand new uh, vehicle, race car with all the bells and whistles. But when you get in there, you still got to program the clock, the radio, you got to make it your own and, and learn how to drive it and work it. And the, and the harder you drive something, iron sharp, you know, hardens iron. We're blades. And as we go through life, people are our, our stones and those sharpen us, dull us, or polish us out, right? And that dependability, man, and that grit comes from si just showing up. Like people always ask me, like, how do you get to where you're at? I mean, like, you know, you got to do this. You got to study this. I'm like, man, just show up, show up on time and be standing there when they start calling people out. And then through each one of those components, you learn through adversity, the resilience you have in that type of, uh, of adversity. And it gets stronger over time. My, I caught my, my kid one time. He was it, my, I'd cut myself. He's like, how come you don't cry when you cut yourself? I was like, well, I used to. But now that I know that that kind of cut won't kill me and that's the amount of pain that's going to come out of it and what, you know, how to apply pressure and everything that I'd ever learned and been taught, that's kind of one of those things like you have all the information as you go through life, you don't get taught it. It just gets decoded, right? And, and it teaches you that part like, oh, I don't have to sweat that. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about that. And it just opens everything up to a point to where each day builds on itself. And you guys know as well as I do, soldiers and airmen, we can be lazy. I can be lazier than anybody on the planet and I can bitch better than anybody. You know, the sailors, if it's not, if you have a bitch and sailor is a happy sailor, right? <laughs> I mean, there are people who are just upset all the time. That's their job. I mean, it would be boring if we all looked the same and talked the same. I, that would just be boring. Right. And as you go through it, you, when you wake up in the morning, you create your own reality. It's perfect. You're in the mirror, man. You talk smack to yourself. I know y'all do this. I did it. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're good to go. You get dressed up. When you walk outside, the minute you run into somebody else, you just run into their reality. And if they're swinging something a lot heavier than you and darker or meaner than you, then well, stand by. And if they're not, you know, that's how you learn. And we kind of, it's a, it's that positive, negative energy, man. And it, it, the prime example of it is how it works in the military. I mean, you got guys I know, I, I served with guys I know that would commit murder if it was legal. Like they would just literally love to hurt people all the time. But instead, they have been taught to help and save and protect the ones that gave them, gave them the opportunity to do that. That's why you don't have to pay them. That's why they get respect. And I mean, they, they, they could be complete nightmares if we didn't do that to them. But it's all about how you condition ourselves. Everything around you has to be conditioned the same way. Yeah. And the more time you put into it, it's just like you study something, you don't mess with it, it gets shifted. It's still there. You know, it just gets shifted to the back. Yeah. Our seven-year-old daughter, if she falls, she gets up and yells, never quit. So <laughs> 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 Another, you know, same age girl falls off of her bike and she starts crying and our daughter's like, never quit. And I definitely think that's something that she learned, you know, oh, yeah. from Marcus oh, telling her. She had to have her tonsils out. She was scared about it. So every day I would lay her down. I'd dress up in the doctor outfit. I would cover her face. I would kind of, I was like, it's going to feel like pressure on your throat. And for a couple of weeks, I trained her. <laughs> After she got out of the surgery and woke up, she's like, I'm ready for him to put him back in. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just all about how, if you're ready for it, I mean, and that's, so, I mean, we do that with it's, death. She was four. Yeah, she, she was yeah. four. That's so a proud that problem right there. We, we see it so much. We just we're conditioned to understand the full gamut of it. Yeah. And to some other people, they say that we're coarse or we're hard or like, why don't you cry or why don't you show any emotion? I'm like, because I, I've ex I know what death has a smell. When she shows up, you can smell her. And I, I mean, you, when she's around, you know, you just kind of understand that that's part of it. And I don't have any control over it. And and with anything and everything that we go through in life, man, I don't care how old you are. If you get into a situation that you've never experienced, you're gonna act like a child. You, you just will. It's not your fault. It's just the way it is. And in the military, we try to put you in every experience you can. So when you get out, you know, we can pull the, we pull the pressure off. Life will, will keep the pressure on until you either overcome it or you die. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hey, you're you're talking about getting out there, Marcus and uh, Lewis and I. We're going to get out of the military one day, believe it or not. Um, but uh, you know, Stay I'm here for as long as you can. <laughs> 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 right on. Hey, I hear from shipmates and veterans uh, alike out there about life after the military. And uh, especially for you and your experiences, how did it uh, feel the last time you hung up your uniform? So that, they really took care of me and the fact that I, t I just got to put uh, operate in my civilian clothes, right? So I, I could still, when I needed to go get my fix, they would bring me back. Like right now, this is a fix. I'm like seeing you guys in uniform, that's like, all I need. Okay. Because I'm, it's just kind of like undercover operator. And as we transition towards the end of your career, you spend a lot more time in your civvies. It, 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 it does need to happen like that. It's the hardest thing in the world is to get out of the military because they do all that stuff to train us to get in. And then the day I was out, I'll never forget walking out of the gate. My freaking badge didn't work. <laughs> you know, the guy thinks that you're critical to the team. Like, they could not, I couldn't make it without me. And then your damn key card doesn't work, and you're like, oh, all right. <laughs> but remember this part, okay? When you take the uniform off, they don't take what came with it. There you go. Right? That's all inside of you. Yeah. It's always incumbent upon us to start at the bottom. Like, I get guys that are like, hey, I, you know, I've been in it 40 years. 40 years is not really a long time. You don't realize that till you at 40, but this is the best time. All right, so – Guys will want to get out and be the CEO or something. I'm like, hey, man, start in the mailroom, right? Start at the bottom and learn everybody's names and what you need. To, you'll, you'll make ranks so fast. It's not even fun. I mean, they wouldn't even keep you down there, really. They'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa what, are you, what is this guy doing there? He's, you know, and it's, it, it's like that. It's, um, it's like if you got a black belt in jiu-jitsu, man, you go into another schoolhouse, put that white belt on in case there's somebody in there that can tune your ass up and just so you learn. And, and I, that was one of the biggest – and I got that advice from some of the advocates. They were like, hey – they were always about staying humble to me. Stay humble, stay humble. Work harder than everybody else. Just stay humble. We're just workhorses. You know what I mean? That's, that's kind of what we do. And our, our language is different. So when you try to assimilate back in the civilian world, you'll make a joke that you think is funny to us, which it is. And civilians do not think our jokes are funny. They, they just don't think that's funny. <laughs> at, at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're just like, okay. So to come in like a new guy trying to learn the, the, the language and what goes on and and remember that and always laugh at yourself because civilians will pick on you like we do. That's how you know you're doing a good job. People are messing with you. It's like if everyone in, in civilian where they don't mess with you. So you think you're not doing a good job. It's reversed. And I, I didn't know that. So once I, I kind of picked that up, I was like, okay, so always study your environment and what you're in. And, 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 and uh, when you walk into a room man, you'll see who's in charge, who's really in charge, who thinks they know what's going on and who, do, who doesn't. You know, it's by the way they carry themselves, by the way their uniforms. You could always tell those squared away so soldiers are the ones who wanted you to think they were squared away. They're easy to spot once you put some rank on. In the beginning, you know, we don't know nothing. I have a funny story. We went to visit somebody at the Bud's compound, and um, one of the kids wanted a drink. And so we went into the exchange, and he didn't have his military ID, and he couldn't buy <laughs> whatever it was they wouldn't even let him i got him. upset yeah they wouldn't let him like, you're gonna give me this <laughs> it was like <laughs> buying a bottle of water or something but they wouldn't let him do it because he didn't have his military id and he's like but uh, you know i've been kicked out of usos uh -huh. a couple times they didn't like, have his i didn't have my ID. id i was like you can't come in here i was like okay <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like that in, in, when we're when we're in it's like if my i i walked into the pentagon with the admiral one time and my ID expired that day and the Marine working the door wouldn't let me in. The look on the Admiral's face, mm -hmm. I thought, I thought he was going to be mad at the Marine. He turned around and looked at me for being a, a turd because I didn't get my ID squared away. Yeah. <laughs> well, because of his you know what I mean? retirement, his medical uh, retirement, it's not supposed to ever expire. It was a mistake on my like home, admin. My records are Yeah, it was crazy. But they were mad at him for it not being squared away i'm like i'll I'm never i'll never forget that it's pentagon that marine looking at me he's like hey sailor he, he called me that no one ever called me that like hey sailor <laughs> <laughs> i mean and wouldn't let it go he had one of the perfect jaw marines you know that he didn't even have hair <laughs> <laughs> I was like all right <laughs> right on all right uh, marcus and, and and melanie both i i we touched briefly on the team never quit uh, mentality, uh, but what about the podcast? 
uh, Team Never Quit podcast? Is this something that you're both involved in? Uh, what's the mission and where can our viewers go to listen to this podcast? They can listen on any pod podcast platform, um, iTunes, they can go to our website, they can go to, I mean, literally anywhere that a podcast airs, it's on there. Um, YouTube even, YouTube, we don't have a whole lot um, uploaded, but we do have some. But I'm kind of, I'm a behind the scenes person. I've been behind the scenes running the podcast since the very beginning. Um, recently, I've started to co-host with Marcus um, when Morgan is out of town or Morgan's got a lot of irons in the fire. So if he can't make it, I sub in um, as a co-host, but it's Marcus and Morgan are the main co-host. We have people on that just have great perspectives or never quit stories and hopefully someone listening will be motivated by that and um, learn something from it. Yeah, each person connects us with somebody different in, 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 in the audience. It's not just in the United States, global. Mm -hmm. And the minute you kind of turn somebody away and you think, oh, they're not, the thing's not cool enough, well then you kind of, you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. Like a, a never quit story <laughs> for us is different than, than it's, a, it's just a, a regular story, right? And, and, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the greatest part about it is that if you're in the military and you've been trained by the government and the civilians, remember that most people don't get that combo. So if you're proficient at something, you're, you're actually proficient at it. I mean, you're, you're the best there is. Mm -hmm. And everyone else is trying to figure it out. That's another cool thing about being in the uniform, man, is they, they streamline that to us to make sure it runs the way it does. And that's the reason the military keeps running the way it does. And everyone else trying to catch up with that. That's why the military contractors are so big. And when people coming out of the military had anything to do with this or coming out, man, they just, they're, they're wanting you. So when never think that, that the, your opinion doesn't, or your perspective doesn't matter either. I mean, we all have opinions, right? But I mean, as you, when you come out of there, your perspective, because you've had to road test it, not only did you have to learn it, you had to road test it. Um, we get to meet just these people from all walks of life mm -hmm. that have been in, in, in just, the, the craziest scenarios and situations and trying to explain it. And when you, when you kind of step back, yeah, the person's different and the scenario might be a little different, but getting through all that, that's the same, mm -hmm. right? If you can, you can apply that and there's the, the tweaks and peaks, but that's the greatest thing that we, uh, that we picked up out of that, you know, and, and she and I rotate through, you know, we'll, we'll do something for a while and build it up and, and get it running and then hand it off and we'll go do something else. And it's just, our, it's the way we stay connected to everybody. Well, the podcast we've been doing for over four years, the first three years, um, Marcus co-hosted with another SEAL, David Rutherford. And after three years of him flying to Texas to record, um, it just got tiring and hard on his family. So we transitioned to doing it with Marcus and Morgan. But um, it's still going strong. During Corona, we've had to do a lot of replays on shows just because it's hard to get people connected. Well, um, we don't have internet out in the rain. I mean, there's yeah. places out here we still have internet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're out in the middle of nowhere. It was really hard, but we're about to start our interviews back up soon. And um, <laughs> we love the podcast. It's it's the feedback that we get from listeners is so motivating. How it's helped people. I mean, some people will say that it kept them from suicide. Yeah. Some people will say that. It helped them get through cancer treatments or whatever it is. Um, we've gotten amazing feedback, and that's what keeps us going. I heard that one time. They, they told me that. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, I, I, was, I was in the middle of killing myself. Mm -hmm. wow. And they listened. They like, literally in the middle of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, if you have enough stones to do that, then you have enough stones to turn and not do it yeah. and push that back forward. And when you hear somebody say, like, hey, you know, just kind of listening to you, you talk about your experiences, which are, we're all the same. You know, that's a cool part about what we do. There's that connection. The minute out here, guy, when y'all find somebody in the uniform, you can spot them by the way they walk. The minute they're sitting there, it's just, I don't care what branch you're in. It was just, it's just a good time. Yeah. You know, the, it, it just is. Yeah. We when, like our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Bernard, Bernard out there, he's asking, what is the podcast? And it's team never quit. It is. Bernard yeah. watching out there, right? Mm-hmm. So just do a little Google search team, never quit Bernard and it'll pop right up. Yeah. We have a website and you can just listen straight on the website or you could go to iTunes. What's the website? Plug it in, Melanie, please. It's just team never But, um, the podcast is free. Um, you don't have to pay to download it or anything. Okay. Awesome. So 
let's let's we're going to get back to that in, in a second to all these you know social media all these handles but i want you to tell us about the lone survivor foundation its mission and how we can get involved and of course all the audience members well let's start off my own experience i was in a hospital in germany and, were, and the, my doctor's like hey what, what, what would you like to do i was kind of I was miserable and uh i was like well you can send me home send me back to, to the ranch and fat me up big me around my friends and they're like, okay, we'll take you home. They came with me. Mm-hmm. And it, the, the whole being back around my friends and, and not being around people, not that the doctors do that, but you know, the hospitals, they'll patch you up. But if you stay in there too long, then that's not what they're for. You kind of die a little bit again. As soon as they got me around my friends and my family and my teammates, I just started healing. And, I, and I, I'm not special anyway. I was like, hey, if that could work for me, it could work for anybody. So when I got out, with the book and the, and the movies and everything else, it's like char- charity is part of it. I mean, just to give to give back. So anytime I would do something with the military, facilitate me, they would send me somewhere. If it, if it worked on me, if it healed me up, I'd, I'd, I'd make it up in the civilian world. I'd take it and, and give it to them and build it up. And I've, I've done that with, with multiple. And I still go to each one of the, um, the facilities that put me together. January, February, I live in a hospital in Florida do my physical therapy, they put me back together. I get to coach kids going into the, to the NFL. You know, after that, we come out, we, we mentor kids out here on the ranch. And it's just a, one of those in between. It's all about giving back down to the ones below us. But Lone Survivor Foundation specifically does retreats. That is their, um, that's what they do. Um, they have uh, retreats for the veteran, like just the veteran themselves. And then they have a follow-up retreat with the veteran and the family. So. If they're married and they've got kids, it's the whole family. It's the wife and kids and everybody. And it's a way for them to learn just like how to talk to each other again. Yeah, that's, a lot of, that's huge. Cause um, you can heal the veteran up and put them back with the family and the family gone, they, they go through it too. So yeah. they, they'll, they'll digress back to where they but you bring the whole unit out and train them up just like the way we do it with, with ourselves. Yeah. So it's really, a, they focus on family and bringing that unity back together and learning like, how to talk to each other and you know just i don't know um it's focused like for ptsd and when guys are having or even girls are having a hard time just being able to connect with their family um it's a back to basics i mean around yeah. the horses you're fishing i mean there's none of this stuff with the computer you know I mean, it's just like hey if you're busted up man exactly we're gonna drag you all the way back to the beginning yeah it's just a holistic approach to bringing the family unit back together and putting them as a team to work together. And it's every branch of the military um, is welcome. There's no charge for it. You just have to apply on the website. Um, we never tried to mass produce it. I mean, you could you could throw as much money as you want into something, but then the, the out, you know, it doesn't produce what you want. Mm-hmm. And then once we figured out how the, the cycle worked, then we, we, we locked it in and kept it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, you can go to lonesurvivorfoundation.org and there's applications on there. If you know somebody that might need it, um, it's really just a way for veterans to, to kind of find themselves again and to um, reunite with their family. And if they're not married, you could bring like your brother or your mother, whoever your support system is. Because there are around 43,000 non-for-profits out there. I mean, for the veterans getting out, there's never been more set up for them like like when the vietnam guys came out they didn't have anything nothing nothing. not only that they had it they 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 had them it was worse it was shifted yeah they got shit on with us it's it turned back around so when the guys are coming out man if you whatever it is you need it's there Mm -hmm. and then there's those of us who 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 came out early and we we start setting those markers so like when guys when y'all start punching out man you just make a phone call and we'll plug it it needs to be there needs to be a hub, right? Like a DD-214 hub. You just throw that thing in there when you come out and, and boom, you're, you're cycled to whatever you need to go take care of whatever it is you need to go get done. For serving your country, we owe you that. And, you know, that's kind of what we're, we're building out here. Wow. That, that's awesome. Hey, uh, you guys have talked about um, Team Never Quit, uh, Lone Survivor Foundation. Where else can our listeners go to find you online or any other social media platforms that you may have out there? Marcus is on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, and it's all at Marcus Luttrell. 
Okay. And then there's a lot of phony sites that say Marcus Luttrell. So you know you made it. <laughs> he only has one of on each platform um, hey bro i'll get messages from my wife she's like apparently i'm dating somebody or have a wife in a different country and i'm like oh i get awesome i man. get the you craziest know. messages that my husband's <laughs> cheating on me with so and so and i'm like oh, some of these guys come up with some good stuff yeah. i'm like wow <laughs> i'm not even that original yeah <laughs> So I don't think you can handle him. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we have Team Never Quit is, um, I think it's just at Team Never Quit. It might be Team underscore Never Quit. Lone Survivor Foundation, I think is just at Lone Survivor Foundation. And then I'm at Melanie Luttrell. Yeah, I don't have wow. Facebook. I just do Instagram. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, great interview. We're here. We're going to wrap this up here in a second. But before we go, I want to know some simple things, right? What do you two do for fun? What kind of music do you listen to? What are you watching on Netflix? We listen to really old music. Um, like, like what? Like, like so I'll swing get music? And there'll be some, there'll be a gospel song. And then Biggie will come on after that. <laughs> Or, or like some 90s hip hop. She's like a, a 90s gangster. Remember when hip hop came on the scene, right? That was yeah. kind of generation. So it'll be like that. And then there'll be some Frank Sinatra rolling in. And she's glued to Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. So the show Yellowstone on on, on, um, on, Paramount. on Paramount or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's got to have it in the chair when yeah. that thing's going on. Hey, and then I we'll love watch... Jesus and rap. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's... <laughs> That's it, yeah. And then we'll do the Family Feud, the old game shows. We watch Family Feud. Feud and then, uh, no kidding, guys. Sometimes like, I go, I'll go lay down and she makes me watch Golden Girls. Because at mm -hmm. night, I we were in the military girls. on deployment. You know, I watch like John Wick and Platoon mm -hmm. like and like that hardcore, just get in the moment. And I like to watch like Family Ties yeah, and, and I, Golden Girls at night. And so. Golden Girls on TV at night. <laughs> which they're great. Don't get me wrong. I, I love them to death. That. But I just... Yeah. Uh. I can't have like, shooting and stuff going on when I'm going to sleep. It gives me nightmares and I know it gives him nightmares. So I'm like, we need to well, I'm just trying to prep myself for the nightmare. And no. I, 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 I'm right, like, whatever. stop watching that shit if it's going to make you have a nightmare. So we need to listen to somebody laughing. And that's what we do at night. You know what's <laughs> funny? You should make a shirt that says, I love Jesus and rap. That's like hilarious. That's like hilarious right there. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I like Tupac. And I Jesus like, loves rap. That's yeah. the same. Yeah. And I like, you know, um, gospel music. It's all right. Um, and, and country and everything. I like country and, and, and I like, uh, we love Frank Sinatra. We like old. I got on a 70s rock kick the other day i don't um, like 70s rock when we were fishing and then 70s country and then i went into 80s and then the movie thing like like the uh you can get on itunes and they'll have movie themes songs movie from scores. the 80s yeah, yeah from the 80s and just kind of a little bit of everything the older you get you know that's how you travel back in time you get around some of your buddies you start drinking a beer you throw on some old music man you'll go right back to that moment so yeah so. we like old westerns too we'll watch like Benito. Blazing Saddles. Yeah. Good. Great, great show. Yep. Yeah. Don't have a day. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Command oh. Master Chief Wynn, you got anything? No, yeah. hey, this has been a hey, this has been a great interview. Thanks for your time. Thanks for what you're doing for everybody out there. And uh, you know, sorry you couldn't get in the Navy Exchange and, and purchase any water for uh, that uh, sale that day, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, now you know who to call. Now you know who to call, Marcus. Wait a second. I, I got a number right here. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Hey, stick around, Melanie and Marcus, before we go. Let me uh, close this up real quick, but stick around. Don't hang up. Uh, Melanie and Marcus, it's been a true honor having you with us today. Your grit and courage are inspiring. Marcus, you are a true hero. Thank you for your sacrifices for all of us. Melanie, thank you for supporting a true American hero. We appreciate everything you guys have done for this great nation. Having you spend time with us means so much to our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coasties, and their family members. We wish you the best, and we'll be following you around social media. Thank you very much to everyone out there watching. Exchanges are out. Thank you, guys.